My name is Steve Roman, and I'm the treasurer of the College Republicans here at Stony Brook University. Before we begin, let me give you all a brief uh, overview of who Dinesh D'Souza is. Born in India, Mr. D'Souza came to the U.S. as an exchange student at the age of 18 and graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth College. Called one of the top young public policy makers in the country, he quickly became known as a major force in public policy through his books, speeches, and films. Mr. D'Souza is a best-selling author and filmmaker. His films, 2016, Obama's America, and America, Imagine a World Without Her, are respectively the number two and number six widely credited, uh, uh, sorry, uh, respectively the number two and number six highest grossing uh, political documentaries of all time. His latest feature length film, Hillary's America, is widely credited with contributing to Hillary Clinton's defeat in 2016 and quickly joined. And quickly, joined his, and quickly joined his first two films in the top 10 political documentaries of all time. As the author of over 15 nationally renowned books, many of them number one New York Times bestsellers, Mr. D'Souza has been invited to speak to groups all over the country on politics, philosophy, and Christianity. He is a firebrand, a man passionate about his craft. Not only does he bring exciting conservative values to the table, but also the ability to articulate them fluidly and succinctly. We are very excited to host him tonight, but before he comes up, watch this. He's a man of a searching and versatile intellect. He is a man who can bridge cultures and understands history and scholarship, and politics, and theology, and philosophy. My guest this week is an author, a filmmaker, a former policy advisor to Ronald Reagan. Mr. Dinesh D'Souza. This American dream is a dream not just of economic opportunity or success, but it's ultimately a dream where you can be the architect of your own destiny. I grew up in a different world, actually a world without America. And although I grew up without a phone, without television, uh, without hot water, uh, we had a car, but if you looked down the floor of our car, you could see the ground. He's been described as an influential conservative thinker. He's a best-selling author, political commentator, and filmmaker. The great man, Dinesh D'Souza, a patriotic man. No longer would I say that I live in a rarefied world of intellectual debate. I've seen the upside of America, and I've seen the downside of America. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't trade the United States for any other country. At the end of the day, my enthusiasm for American government may have dimmed, but my enthusiasm for this country burns brighter than ever. Thank you very much. was here about five years ago, but before your time, and politics has heated up a little bit since then. In fact, it's such an anomalous situation because normally in American politics you have an election, and it's a superheated election, and uh, even the media gets into it, you know, lobbying for one candidate, huffing and puffing to drag the crooked hag across the finish line. <laughs> Very constipated expressions on the face of Wolf Blitzer on election night. <laughs> Trying to find some more votes in Pennsylvania. But, the election is over. And it's customary in American politics for the side that wins to be jubilant, and for the side that loses to be sullen, but not mutinous. 
and to kind of digest the result and live to fight another day. That's the normal rule. Now, American politics, since Trump, has not been like that. We have actually seen a kind of abnormal, tempestuous struggle, and the struggle is over the very legitimacy of the guy who won the election. Almost as if to say that one can put his electoral victory into question if he is deemed by some people to be out of bounds, so far outside the mainstream that it's okay to run the guy out of town. And interestingly for the country, for us, all the big issues of American politics have sort of fallen by the wayside. We had tax reform, but no tax reform debate. We had a real change in the shape of the court with Gorsuch, but no real debate about constitutional reasoning or what the court is for, jurisprudence, none of that. Foreign policy is treated, again, just as a kind of political football. No analysis of what's going on. Who's a bigger threat, Russia or China? Nobody knows. Now, why is this? Why is it that, that all political debate in America is now on hold? Well, the reason is that we have seen since the election, and unceasingly to the present, the general idea that Trump, in particular, but more broadly, the Trumpsters, um, the Republican Party that's lined up behind Trump, uh, these guys are racists. The favorite term now is not racism so much as white supremacy. Uh, when I was a student at Dartmouth in the early 80s, people talked about prejudice. And then prejudice sort of metamorphosed into racism. And then racism metamorphosed into something that was called institutional racism. And now, the kind of umbrella term, white supremacy. So Trump is allegedly a white supremacist. The Republican Party, the party of white supremacy. And uh, normally, this would be kind of incendiary enough. The very idea that the American people have sort of, you may say, reinstalled a white supremacist in the White House. But on top of that, we have sort of a second explosive accusation to magnify the first one. And that is that Trump is not only a white supremacist and a racist, but he is also a fascist. A fascist. And again, it's not just Trump. The idea is that the right, the conservatives, are sort of the, the neo-Nazi party. Uh, look at the rally in Charlottesville. Didn't we see some Klansmen and some neo-Nazis and weren't they wearing the Make America Great Again hats? So the idea here is that America is facing a kind of clear and present danger of a kind it's probably not faced in a very long time, which is that a kind of outright white supremacist slash fascist has somehow gotten a hold of the Oval Office. And we are in a situation that sort of you could call it Hitler circa 1933, by which I mean that if that were what America were facing now, it would be actually justified to use, you may say, any means necessary to stop this, to resist it, to block it, to get Trump out of there. It doesn't, didn't matter if it was Russia collusion or Stormy Daniels. If we can find a way, some excuse, some allegation, some obstruction, never mind the underlying crime, it's justified because it would have been justified to do that against Hitler. Think of all the carnage that would have been prevented in the future. So what I thought I'd do this evening, this being an academic environment, is to actually probe these two accusations uh, the accusation of white supremacy and the accusation of fascism. Asking a, a little deeper question than simply, is Trump a racist, is Trump a fascist? Because 
these allegations against Trump and the Republicans are actually much bigger. They predate Trump. For example, the notion that the Republican Party is the racist party. I mean, literally, if you had said that for the vast um, amplitude of American history, people would not even know what you meant. It would sound like crazy talk. Uh, but this idea since the 1960s has developed that the parties switch sides. They traded platforms. There was a big switch. That, that Richard Nixon, with his Southern strategy, wooed the Southern racists away from the Democratic Party, imported them into the Republican Party. This is conventional wisdom. It's in the textbooks, it's taught in the schools, it's regurgitated by the media, it's on the History Channel. So the idea that the Republicans are the bad guys is taken for granted. In fact, it's taken for granted so much that the head of the RNC, not the current head, but the previous head, a guy named Ken Melman, was literally going to black churches in the early 2000s and apologizing for the racist history of the Republican Party. So, this is what I call, the reason my last book was called The Big Lie, this is what I call a big lie so powerful that the very target of the lie begins to believe it. He begins to confess. And so this is a remarkable phenomenon. As I say, this goes, this is long before Trump. This started in the 60s, this whole narrative. Now, the idea that fascism is on the right is also widely accepted. Most people think, well, obviously fascism is on the right. Look at World War II. Here you've got the Soviet Union on one side, communists on the left, fighting against the fascists, Mussolini's uh, Italy, uh, Hitler's Germany. So if communism is on the left, ergo, it follows that fascism is on the right. Now, in reality, this kind of visual contrast is a fallacy. And it's a fallacy because sister ideologies that are often very close to each other are notorious for fighting fratricidal wars. Think, for example, of the Shia and the Sunni. Uh, the Shia and the Sunni are both inside the House of Islam. Any Muslim will tell you that the degree of difference in actual belief between a Shia and a Sunni is a hair's breadth. It's essentially an argument over the baton of succession. Uh, but these are sister ideologies in the same camp, and yet they've been fighting for centuries. Why? Because they're fighting over a fine point of doctrine, or they're fighting over power, or they're fighting over territory. So all I'm trying to say is, it is by no means obvious that if two parties are fighting, they are ideological opposites. I mean, think of the United States. The United States itself shifts alliances. We allied with Stalin, a really bad guy, because another guy, another bad guy, Hitler, poses a threat. So foreign policy alliances are not all that illuminating in terms of the underlying ideology of the countries involved. Now, so we're facing two claims. Is fascism on the right? Is racism a phenomenon of the conservatives? And I want to discuss both. I'm going to start by talking about fascism a little bit, and then I'm going to pick up the bigger theme of racism. You can see that these two topics are really related in the sense that fascism, at least in its most virulent form, namely National Socialism, Nazism, fascism was a racist doctrine. Hitler was an anti-Semite. So fascism and white supremacy are connected in that way. But let's talk for a minute about fascism. Now the first thing to say about fascism is that almost nobody, even very educated people, know what it is. And this alone is strange. If fascism was this great evil thing in the 20th century, almost our, our, um, um, our way of measuring evil and horror, how is it that none of us can really very easily say what fascism really believes? Who's the great philosopher of fascism? 
Interesting question, right? With any other philosophy, you can say right away. Who's the great philosopher of capitalism? Adam Smith. Who's the great philosopher of Marxism? Marx. Who's the great philosopher of Christianity? Jesus, St. Paul. Uh, who's the great philosopher of fascism? Dead silence. Dead silence. Nobody knows. Now, the reason I want to suggest is that since World War II, fascism has undergone a redefinition. But I'll come to that. Let's explore at the beginning this idea that Trump is a fascist. So why is Trump a fascist? First, Trump is a fascist because he's an authoritarian. Now right away you say, wait a minute, is Trump an authoritarian? Every day when I turn on the TV, when I turn on the radio, when I go to social media, Trump is flayed on every imaginable platform. Morning to night, and I don't, I don't just mean by Wolf Blitzer and Rachel Maddow, he's flayed by every comedian, every talk show host, it goes on and on. Now real authoritarians wouldn't put up with this. If it was Mussolini, he'd send a bunch of black shirts, they would beat these people up, and all of this would stop. Clearly Trump isn't doing that. Right? The other day I saw Cher, um, uh, what, uh, this was some sort of a show on TV, and she goes, you know, Trump beat the shit out of me on Twitter. <laughs> on Twitter. Real black shirts don't beat you up on Twitter. They beat you up, period. But, but let's say that Trump was an authoritarian. That still wouldn't make him a fascist, because there have been authoritarian leaders since the beginning of time, Virtually every monarch, every aristocratic party, uh, every third world dictator is an authoritarian. Are they all fascists? No. Well, Trump is a fascist because, you know, he's, um, um, he's an ultra-nationalist. He wants to make America great again. Well, didn't Hitler want to make Germany great again? Well. Nationalism is not a defining feature of either the left or the right. To see this, consider the following. Mandela, in South Africa, was a nationalist. Gandhi, in India, ultra-nationalist. All the anti-colonial leaders to a man, nationalists. Nkrumah in Ghana, for example. Ho Chi Minh, nationalist. Fidel Castro fierce nationalist. Winston Churchill, nationalist. Abraham Lincoln, nationalist. The American founders, nationalist. So what sense does it make to take all of these people and lump them together and call them fascist? I mean, this is just downright stupid. This is not what fascism really is at all. So how is it that all these people are spouting about fascism and they don't seem to be getting to what fascism even means. Now, interestingly, historically, fascism developed on the left. Now, this is not even, this is not even controversial because Mussolini, the founder of fascism, the, the man who established the first fascist regime in the world, long before Hitler, Mussolini was a Marxist. In fact, he was with Gramsci, the, the most famous Marxist in Italy. And uh, Mussolini, when he founded the fascist party, received a telegram of congratulations from Lenin. Why? Because Lenin recognized Mussolini as a fellow leftist revolutionary like himself. I've made a list of all the early founders of fascism in every major European country, in Britain, in Spain, in Germany, in France, and, and in Italy. Every single one of them, without exception, was either a socialist or a man of the left. So fascism's roots are on the left, not on the right. Hitler was a national socialist. Hitler changed the name of the German Workers' Party to the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Why? To get the word socialist in there. Incredibly, since World War II, there has been a massive effort to yank the socialism out of National Socialism. To sort of pretend that Hitler claimed to be a socialist 
but he actually wasn't. Now, the beauty of living today is that, you know, information is available at our fingertips. You don't have to like take my word for it. You can really check it out for yourself. So I would recommend that if you doubt what I'm saying, check out the 25 point platform of the Nazi party. This is the actual platform on which the Nazis campaigned repeatedly over the space of a decade to come to power. And then take that platform and read it aloud. Now, the platform is a little dated in its vocabulary. It uses words like usury, ancient word. We need to cross out usury and write in interest. Interest rates. There's also the recurrence of the word Jew. And as a thought experiment, I recommend that just provisionally, just for now, we cross out the, the word Jew and write in the top 1%. But with those, two, with those two minor changes, right? If you took the Nazi 25 foreign platform, if I whipped it out of my pocket, and I went to the Democratic National Convention in 2016 and read it aloud, it would have gotten thunderous, virtually uninterrupted applause. Why? Why? Because, quite honestly, it, it sounds like it was written by a joint committee of Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and maybe uh, Schumer and Pelosi, all together, <laughs> putting together their laundry list of favorite proposals. Now, this is actually fascism. The, the great philosopher of fascism, to answer my own question of earlier, was the philosopher Giovanni Gentile who was actually seen as one of the great philosophers of the early 20th century, a student of Bergson and Hegel. Uh, uh, Gentile was, became Mussolini's minister of education. And in defining fascism, Gentile says, everything in the state, nothing outside the state. And here's what Gentile really means. He really means that Unlike liberal democracy, where we are all individuals and we have rights, Gentile says that, that society is more like a living organism. It's more like a living creature. And every individual is like a cell inside the living organism. So, the cell, is, the cell has no rights. The cell has no value in itself. The cell's only value is what it serves the organism as a whole. And if the cell becomes rebellious, or the cell begins to, to, to sort of march out of lockstep with the organism, cut it out. Cut it out, literally. So this is fascism. Fascism is the idea that we have a single community. The Nazi slogan was the common good over the individual good. And the idea here is that we are a single community and the spokesman for the community is the centralized state. No individuals have rights above the state. The state tells you what to do. Now that doesn't mean the state has to own everything. So the fascists weren't communists. They were socialists of a, of a particular type. So for example, the fascists believe that the government doesn't have to own industry. But the government must control it and regulate it and tell it what to do. So if you look up the dictionary definition of fascism, the economic definition, it's very clear. State-run capitalism. That's fascism. Now, if all of this seems somewhat theoretical, just, just ask yourself a simple question. What is the current economic philosophy of the party that we know as the Democratic Party? People say the Democratic Party is capitalist, or the Democratic Party is socialist. But none of that actually works. None of that really works because when is the last time a Democrat gave an actual speech praising the workings of the free market? You have to go really far back, before FDR, to find it. So the Democrats clearly aren't excited about capitalism. If you stood up at the Democratic National Convention and went, capitalism, capitalism, rah, 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 you'd get dead silent. You'd see the faces that you saw at, at Trump's State of the Union. You know, that sort of, sort of deadly look. You know, so capitalism is not it. That's a fake. Is it socialism? Not really. Why? 
Because what do socialists do? I mean, I, I came from a country that was socialist for about 40 years, all my growing up years. Socialists nationalize industries. So the energy industry, take it over. The airline industry, take it over. Rename it Air India. And that's not what the Democrats do now. What do they do? What, what happened under Obama over eight years? <laughs> what basically happened is number one, the government, the government established full control over the banking sector. Most banks ceased to be private banks. They became government banks. Second, full government control over the investment industry. Investment houses essentially ceased to become independent in investment houses. They're now under the thumb of the government. Full control over the healthcare industry. Now, we have a private healthcare industry, right? We have hospitals, we have insurance companies, but who tells them what to do? The state. Who tells them what prices to charge, what to cover, what not to cover? The state. And so increasingly, you have banking, you have investments, you have automobiles. Obama fires the head of General Motors. You're out. Private company, fired by the president. This is state-run capitalism, which is to say, this is basically fascism. The government establishing a stranglehold on private industry and directing the energy industry, the auto industry, the banking industry, this is straight out fascism by the clinical definition of the term. Now, the other thing about fascism is, you know, Mussolini had his black shirts, Hitler had his brown shirts, and typically when people talk to me about fascism, they always point to Antifa. There are the fascists, Antifa. And I'm like, Antifa? These are basically overgrown infants who are coming out of their mom's basement, you know. Mom, I'm trying to find my costume. I'm trying to find my outfit. Where's, where's my bike lock? Where's my bike lock? I want to go find some fascists. Look, these people are imbeciles. They're not fascists, they're not anti-fascists. They, these are ignoramuses. They wouldn't even, they don't even know what fascism is. A much more dangerous fascism in our society right now is not these guys. It is the use of the weapons of the government against your political opposition. That is really scary stuff. When, when one political party gets to say, okay, I'm going to call on the CIA. I'm going to call on the FBI. I'm going to start doing political surveillance of my opponents. Uh, I'm going to see if Michael Moore is about to make a movie, and we're going to send the IRS to go look at his last five years of tax returns. This is un-American. This is actually fascism in its pure sense. Weaponizing the state against your political opposition. Now, I'm not saying that this is actually an enduring feature of the Democratic Party. It isn't. I can't even imagine like Jimmy Carter waking up and saying, I'm going to get the FBI to go after the Republicans. Michael Moore's about to make a movie. Let's put the guy in jail. No, Carter didn't even think that way. But Obama did. And Hillary did. And so what I'm suggesting is that we've seen a gangsterization of American politics in the last eight years. I mean, I've seen it up close. But you're a convicted felon. Yes, I am. So, so is Martin Luther King. I mean, lots of people, Mandela's a convicted felon. Gandhi was a convicted felon. Lots of convicted felons. It's, it's worth spending a minute on this topic. My criminal offense, uh, my breaking of the law, and I did break the law, was to give $20,000 of my own money to a college friend of mine running for the Senate in New York, Wendy Long. Wendy Long was 40 points behind in the polls. There was no way she could win. I didn't even tell her I was doing it. but. She was running a desperate uphill campaign. I wanted to help her. I told two of my friends, give her $10,000, which is the campaign limit. I'll reimburse you. Now, justice is not simply a matter of did you break the law. It is always a matter of two closely related questions. Does the penalty fit the crime? 
And did other guys who did roughly the same thing get the same penalty? Yeah. Because if I were to be speeding on the highway, going 20 miles over the speed limit, and you gave me 10 years in prison, and then when I stood up to give a speech, or went on social media, 10 guys come on, Dinesh, you're a felon, you broke the law. Yes, but nobody else who goes 20 miles over the speed limit got that penalty. So, I say for those people who think, I deserve my fate, can you name a single case in all of American history where some guy gave 20 grand of his own money with no corruption, no return, no quid pro quo, no deal, and was incarcerated for eight months overnight for doing it. If you can cite a single case, I will then take it all back and admit that I deserve everything I got. Now, the House Oversight Committee currently has my FBI file. Heavily redacted, but they do have it. When you open my FBI file, the first thing it says in big letters, this man is a conservative who made a movie blasting the Obama administration. And my question is, why is that in my FBI file? In other words, if this is not a political hit, if I'm not being red flagged as a dangerous political threat to petty narcissistic Obama, sitting there, you know, waiting for his portrait in the flowers. <laughs> Peace-loving flower child Obama. <laughs> then, why am I red flagged as a conservative? Why does the FBI assign $100,000 at the outset to investigate a $20,000 case? These are facts. I'm not making this stuff up. In fact, I'm making none of it up. Part of what, part of what makes all this so strange, and will make this whole talk so strange, is that I'll tell you things that will that seem hard to believe. That's why sometimes people laugh because, see, they know that what I'm saying isn't true. Right. But then you have to ask, how do they know this, right? And this is how they know it. This is how big lies get told. Small lies are actually hard to get away with. If somebody were to come to me and say, um, you know, your neighbor stole your car. I can tell very easily if he's lying. First of all, I, feel, I have to be missing my car. Second of all, I can go over to my neighbor's driveway and look to see if my car's there. Now, small lies can be checked out, but big lies can't. If somebody tells you fascism is on the right, let's ask yourself, how did you get to know that? Well, first of all, some professor in some article or book wrote it. And then his 10 of his colleagues all said, this study of fascism is the greatest study of fascism that's come out in the last 10 years. And then the New York Review of Books ran a lavish review of that book, and then Michael Moore got wind of it and made a documentary, and NPR interviewed this guy, uh, and then later Steven Spielberg got the idea to make a movie, and so the ordinary dude goes, I read it over here, and I heard it over there, and I turned on NPR, and sure enough, they're talking about it, that's how I know it's true. In other words, it's the same reverberating fact that is bounced from one place to another, from academia to Hollywood to the media, and that's how we know it. Even though the underlying fact has never been checked. And in fact, can't be checked. Let's say you in the third row know that this is a flat out lie. What would you do? Put it out on social media? You don't have a megaphone like Steven Spielberg or NPR. In other words, you would be crushed by the overwhelming weight of the information being blared out there, and your little dissent would be unimportant. Okay, for this reason, I pivoted in my own career from being a think tank guy, a pointy-headed academic, to making movies. Why? Because I said to myself, it would be kind of nice if I built a megaphone of my own. Now, in all these topics, there is a great deal of obfuscation. And I would go on campuses and I'd talk about racism and slavery, and I would say things like the Democratic Party is the party of enslavement. And literally, some professor of romance languages at Bowdoin College would stand up and he'd go, Mr. D'Souza, 
What you have just said is extremely simplistic. You are ignoring the fact that there's plenty of blame to go around. These are not, these are American problems. You can't point your finger at one party or the other. This is essentially something that implicates all of us. Now, when I hear this kind of thing, to me, this is the proverbial squid-like cloud of rhetoric that it is part of my career mission at this point to, to point an Ahab-like javelin at and puncture irrevocably and, and, and irretrievably. And so in the movie Hillary's America, I decided, look, let me try to puncture this with a single statement. Let me put it out there. And when you put out a statement, it's very important to make your statement scientific, by which I mean refutable. If you make a statement that says things like, in general and for the most part, then there's always room for fudging. And so in Hillary's America, I made the following statement that in 1860, now this is the year before the Civil War, no Republican owned a slave. Notice, I'm not saying no Republican leader owned a slave. I'm saying no Republican in the entire United States owned a slave. All the slaves in the entire country, four million of them, were owned by Democrats. Now, those are fighting words. And the beauty of this statement, its scientific character, is it only requires a single valid counterexample to force me to take it back. And yet, in the over 18 months now since that movie has come out, not one valid counterexample has surfaced, despite many efforts. About six months ago, a PhD researcher wrote me, Dinesh, I gotcha, I gotcha. I've been looking at this, and I found out that Ulysses S. Grant inherited a slave, admittedly a solitary slave, one guy, on his wife's side. And I go, that was a near touche. But I have to call it a near touche, because at the time that that happened, Ulysses S. Grant was a Democrat. <laughs> he became a Republican later, when Lincoln elevated him as a general. So, here's my point. Think about this for a minute. This means that the slavery debate was not, didn't have blame to go around. In fact, this means that the slavery debate was not even a North-South debate. This is the killer. See, the reason that we have all these half-wits going through and pulling down Confederate statues. Oh, let's pull down this Confederate statue of the Confederate soldier. First of all, do you have any idea who the Confederate soldier was? The ordinary Confederate soldier didn't own slaves. He was a dirt poor farmer or a dirt poor laborer. When one of them was interviewed after the war and asked, why did you fight the Yankees? Why did you fight in the Civil War? You have no stake in slavery. The guy goes, because the Yankees were down here. That was his reason. This was his world and his life, and the Yankees came over and tried to take it away, and he fought them. And this is the guy you want to demonize. This is the villain of American history, the real scary guy. Nonsense. When Abraham Lincoln identified what he called, in a sense, the four horsemen, the four, the four demons of slavery, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, we might say, using the biblical analogy, he named all four. Let's look at them. Roger Tawney, a southerner, author of the Dred Scott decision from Maryland. Not really a northern state, but kind of. So let's call, uh, not really a southern state, but kind of. Let's call Roger Tony a southerner. Pierce, Franklin Pierce, the former president from New Hampshire. James Buchanan, the current president from Pennsylvania. And Stephen Douglas, Abraham Lincoln's rival from Illinois. Notice that three out of the four are northern Democrats. They're not Southerners. So what I'm getting at is that while the secession debate was North-South, the slavery debate was between a pro-slavery Democratic Party, North and South, and an anti-slavery Republican Party, period. That was the division. Now that division has been camouflaged subsequently. Now, recently I got into this in social media and people go, well, Dinesh, you're talking about things that happened a really long time ago. You're ignoring the fact that the parties switched sides. You're ignoring the fact that they traded platforms. First of all, this kind of nonsense goes unchecked because people have been saying it and nobody challenges them. 
The parties traded platforms. You know, this would be like if, this is like history for suckers. It's like if I came to you and said, guys, I got some news for you. At some point in American history, the cops decided to become robbers, and the robbers decided to become cops. They just traded places. You'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? Are you out of your mind? How could such a process even occur? So let's see if it's true that the parties traded platforms, okay? And, and I'm gonna use as my example Abraham Lincoln because to this day people go, Dinesh, you're ignoring the fact that Abraham Lincoln was actually a progressive. And the Republican Party was the progressive party. Now Abraham Lincoln, in talking about slavery, he goes, many things can be said about it, but at the core, at the core, slavery means this. You work and I eat. That's slavery. Slavery is the theft of another guy's labor. You work and I eat. And Lincoln goes that that's the platform of the Democratic Party. He goes, the platform of the Republican Party is the opposite of that. And Lincoln puts it very clearly. The hand that makes the corn has the right to put the corn in its own mouth. Which is to say that people get the right to keep their own stuff and the fruits of their own labor, what Lincoln calls the free labor system. Now, let's fast forward from the 1850s to now, and I ask you, is it not the case even now that the central core of the Republican Party today is that the hand that makes the corn gets to eat the corn? And is it not also a fact that the central platform of the Democratic Party now, admittedly in a different form, but nevertheless is not very different from the simple slogan, you work, I eat. It is. So where is the, where is the trading of platforms? Where is the, where is the so-called switch? Now, in fairness, it should be admitted that blacks, who used to be Republicans, did become Democrats. And it should also be admitted that the South, which used to be heavily Democratic, is now largely Republican. This is a little bit like the business with the Soviet Union and Hitler. It gives some surface support to the idea of some sort of switch. But when you look a little more closely, you realize right away that these switches are not what the left is talking about at all. For example, blacks did not become Democrats for reasons having anything to do with race. Proof? In 1932, when FDR first ran against Herbert Hoover, Hoover got two-thirds of the black vote. Republican. In 1936, when FDR ran again, FDR got 71% of the black vote. The black vote switched from Hoover, Republican, to FDR in the 1930s. Now, this had nothing to do with race. In fact, the Democratic Party was explicitly the party of segregation and the KKK. So why did blacks switch? Why leave the party of emancipation and join this disgusting racist party that essentially uses segregation and racial terrorism as its means of doing business? And the answer is blacks were under incredible duress in the Depression and the New Deal, although segregated, discriminatory, nevertheless offered blacks some crumbs. It was the crumbs of the New Deal. Employment programs, federal supports, government employment. This is what persuaded, wooed African Americans to move over politically to the Democratic camp. What about the South? People say, well, that was because of Nixon. Nixon had a Southern strategy. You know, Nixon made an appeal to the racists in the South, the Deep South particularly, and made them into Republicans. Now, what's really interesting is that, here's again where you can go to your phone, no one has ever uncovered a single racist campaign statement ever made by Richard M. Nixon, <coughs> ever. So right away you see that this thesis is gonna have some problems. And so its advocates, the progressives, people like Kevin Cruz, the historian of Princeton, 
He goes, no, uh, Nixon didn't make an explicit racist appeal. He used racist dog whistles. Racist dog whistles. So in other words, according to Cruz, you've got these racists, and they're like dogs. They have a different um, uh, register for sound. So that Nixon, while saying nothing racist, could make dog whistle sounds to these guys that they hear as racist, but apparently the rest of the country has no clue what's going on. <laughs> This is, this is a serious thesis advocated by a guy at Princeton. Dog whistles. Okay, now what are these dog whistles? Well, according to Kevin Cruz, Nixon kept talking about law and order. Right? And the implication is, he's talking about blacks. And Nixon kept talking about drugs. And the implication is, he's talking about blacks. Now, in fact, for anybody who steps back, and I saw the very end of this, but I did see it, the debate in the 1970s was fundamentally about the Vietnam War. The Nixon slogan in the 70s was the, the Democratic Party. It's kind of a mean-spirited slogan, but it's... The Democratic Party is the party of acid, amnesty, and abortion. What's acid? Drugs. But this is not crack. There was no crack. This is the, this is the hippie anti-war movement of the 60s and early 70s. The flower children, LSD, Timothy Leary, my buddy Bill Ayers. Abortion, Roe versus Wade, nothing racial about that. Amnesty, the people who want to go to Canada to get out of the draft. This was what Nixon can, this is what Nixon meant by law and order. And the proof that Nixon wasn't out to target blacks is the simple fact that the first thing that Nixon did when he came in is he began the country's first affirmative action program. Think about this. If Nixon was anti-black and courting the racist vote, would he be the president who installs the first American program at the federal government to install racial preferences against whites and in favor of minorities? That's Nixon. That's his actual record. So, the, the Nixon Southern strategy argument, it simply falters. It can't go anywhere. And the decisive crusher of it is simply the fact that Nixon lost the Deep South. He didn't win it. George Wallace won it. The Democrat. Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. That George Wallace. He won the Deep South. Now, here are the racist Dixiecrats. And I count them by the people who joined the Dixiecrat Party in the 40s, or the people who voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Pretty good measure of a racist Dixiecrat. And in the Senate, there are about 25 of these guys. In the House, maybe 100. Governors, maybe 20 or 30. So we have about 150 to 200 public officials. These are the Dixiecrats. You can look up the list yourself. And now I ask an empirical question. How many of these racist Dixiecrats became Republicans? Everything hinges on this question, because whatever Nixon's intentions were, did he in fact convince the racist Dixiecrats to become Republicans? And the simple answer is, they didn't. Of all these racist Dixiecrats, only one, Strom Thurmond, moved from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. Every other racist Dixiecrats lived and died and were lionized in the Democratic Party. So the big switch is a big lie. And the Southern strategy is not what it's made out to be. And so now I come to my closing question. And I want to I wanna leave time for questions. I've put a lot on the table. Um, I find myself in the very strange position of being, you know, everyone talks about fake news. I talk about fake history, fake narratives, fake arguments that are used to illustrate theses that cannot, be, cannot withstand the light of day. But then I notice something strange. Not only does the left not want to hear it, but even the right, the intellectual right, is very uncomfortable with these kinds of arguments. They would rather apologize. They would rather plead guilty, rather than get into the muck of what actually happened. 
In reality, the Republican Party, and I, I feel funny saying this because I would not have said this 10 years ago, I didn't even know it to be true. The Republican Party is the only group in America that has no reason to feel guilty about race. Everybody else does, except the Republicans. True. So now we circle back to Trump. Uh, Trump's not a racist, Trump's not a fascist. The real question we have to ask is, the, the real question we have to ask, and I ask this in closing, is people say, well, Dinesh, you talked about history, but where is the racism in the Democratic Party or on the left now? Where is it now? Show it to me. And so I'm going to close by showing it to you. In his great work um, on slavery, it's called The Peculiar Institution, the historian Kenneth Stamp identifies what he calls the five distinguishing features of the old slave plantation. Number one, dilapidated housing, in those days called slave quarters. Number two, broken families. In no slave state were families, slave families, legal. Masters could, of course, sell off slaves, take up with the, uh, with the female slaves on the plantation, producing mulattoes. The family was in disarray, too. Three, a high degree of violence necessary to hold the place together. Slavery is sustained by the whip, because you're extracting forcible labor from people who don't want to give it to you for free. I'll, co I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. No, nobody's ever extracted my labor with a whip. Um, in fact, my whole career now, my ability to speak English, my um, belief in ideas like individual dignity, human rights, separation of powers, checks and balances. Um, I wouldn't be this person that I am now had I not been exposed to Western civilization from a very young age. That's, these are the ideals I digested as a kid. And I have to face the simple fact that the transmission belt of bringing those ideals to India was in fact the British Empire. And every Indian in his bones knows that to be true. The only people who deny it are progressive liars who know nothing about the actual situation on the ground. And these are the people who conduct demonstrations against American capitalism and demonstrations against Nike. If Nike opened an office in Bombay, India, there would be thousands of people lined up to get a job. The Indians don't agree with these jerks and actually believe that they're subverting the India's opportunity to climb up from the bottom of the heap. So, that's on that. Finish my thought. Dilapidated housing, broken families, a high degree of violence. Fourth, no opportunity. Nobody gets ahead. Although the, the Democrats said slavery is a school of civilization, it's not a school from which anyone was allowed to graduate. So nobody got ahead. And finally, as Kenneth Stamp says, nihilism and despair. The trademark psychological features of the plantation. And so, I now ask you to fast forward 150 years, and today, right now, if we were to do a study, spend some time in inner city Oakland, Baltimore, Detroit, Chicago, or not even, let's not even talk about African Americans. Let's go to the Latino barrios. My wife's Latino, she grew up in South Texas. Go down to the barrios of South Texas, or California, or the Native American reservations. These are all the places where the Democrats get 90% plus of the vote. They run all these places. And I ask you, is it not a fact that you will see dilapidated housing, broken families, a high degree of violence necessary to hold the place together? We send in these cops and go, go fix it, go fix it. Go fix that? How? And then, 
No one gets ahead. Intergenerational poverty, intergenerational dependency, and finally, nihilism and despair. It's all there, and it's all right now. And then we see, when I turn on the TV, I see Charlottesville, and I literally see the scene. There's one white supremacist, and the guy himself looks like he doesn't even know where he is. He's a virtual imbecile. He may call himself a neo-Nazi, but the truth of it is Himmler would have sent him straight to the gas chambers. <laughs> because the Nazis actually had a category for imbeciles. So this was a, wall, this was a true imbecile. Right, here he is. But what, what's more interesting is the anthropological environment. He's surrounded by like 40 reporters interviewing him. One guy. Why? It's a deflection. From their point of view, here's where the racism is. Look at this guy. He's a great threat to America. He has no power. He has no cultural authority. He can never be elected to office. He can't do anything. He doesn't even have a job himself. He can't discriminate against anybody. But he's did the threat. Meanwhile, you have a whole political party with massive allies in the media, in Hollywood, and this is, they're running the most impoverished places in America that somehow never seem to improve. And yet, no one demonstrates. There's no Jesse Jackson, no civil rights demands, no one's calling for the school uh, superintendent to resign until the test scores go up, none of it. Why? Because these places, every two years, or every four years, deliver nine out of ten votes for the party that keeps them in this kind of subjugation. So that's my story. And all I can say, you know, is check it out for yourself. I, I could have been lying to you the whole time, I think if you listen to me carefully, you'd realize that I've put a lot on the table, and a lot of it can be checked, and a lot of it can be refuted if the counter evidence exists. And I think sometimes when people listen to me, they go, he must be leaving stuff out. There must be a whole bunch of other things he's not telling us. No, in my books and in my movies, and you'll notice if you saw my America film, I begin by trying to state the other side as strongly as I can. I never withhold a fact that counts against me. In fairness, I try my best to refute it, but I put it out there. And that is not true of the other side. They will not cover facts that don't support their thesis. So the dishonesty isn't on both sides. It's only on one side. And I'll leave you with the thought that, you know, let's leave aside politics. You're in a university. At the end of the day, what's true is more important than what's politically useful or what the, what the public policy implications are. You should be most of all concerned with the Socratic pursuit of truth, and so I leave you imploring you to keep in mind truth with a capital T. And just as you pursue ha happiness in the Jeffersonian sense, let's never forget also to pursue truth. Thank you very much. to like snort from the back row. But now's your chance to come up and um, make your point. Um, so let's see. What let's see what comes out of this. Is it working? Okay. We're gonna have 45 minutes for QA, but of course it's up to Mr. Susan whenever he wants to stop. Uh, there's gonna be one line over here, one line over there. Uh, we're going to go back and forth when you have your questions to ask. Um, also, if you're here for Jay Rose's extra credit, stay until the end. There will be a sign up, sign out sheet at the end. So, Desi, is this on? Also, if I can make a deal with you guys, if you are brief, I'll be brief, and I'll be able to get to almost everybody, if not everybody. If you ask long questions and I give long answers, then we'll only get to three people on each side. So I, I want to do 45 minutes, but I want to try to move it fast if we can. We're going to ask that you limit it to one question per person. Um, and then if you do 
do go over, we're just going to turn the mic off. So, so we're going to start with this side. You've repeatedly called Bill Clinton a rapist while defending Roy Moore against his accusations of both child molestation and sexual assault. This is despite Roy Moore being accused by eight different women, some with contemporaneous evidence such as his own signature and other witnesses who have been told at the time. For what reason do you apply different standards to them besides their political affiliations? the timing that the accusations are old. That's not what I mean. What I mean is this. The accusation against Bill Clinton was made by Paula Jones, right, in the middle of his presidency. Due pro a whole due process train was then unleashed uh, in which Clinton was called to testify. Essentially, Clinton, in effect, admitted guilt, paid $850,000 to Paula Jones. Uh, other accusers then surfaced. Um, and so this whole thing kind of played out. And the American people watched it and they basically said at the end of the day, now we didn't know about Juanita Broderick at that time, but there were other accusers, uh, sexual harassment accusations. And the American people basically got, got, said, we think it's true, but we're not entirely sure, and so we don't think the guy deserves to be thrown out of office because of it. That's how Clinton survived impeachment, because the American people decided not that it was all false, but that the penalty of ejecting the president over this was excessive. Now what happened with Roy Moore is the following. Here's Roy Moore, he's been on the Supreme Court, he's run for things before. Literally at the, at the last hour of the candidacy, all these accusations surface. Now that is actually not a proper environment in which to evaluate them. Because he's coming up for election right now, and we've seen this phenomenon before. All these accusers surface. Roy Moore is defeated. All the accusers melt away. What happened to them? Where are they? They've all gone away. I never see them on TV anymore. They haven't apparently filed lawsuits now. Their goal was to get Roy Moore, right? And so I say to myself, here's a guy, and let's just say that there's a possibility that he was falsely accused, if only by some other women. What possible chance does he have to defend himself in that environment? None. None. So it's political witch huntery is what I'm saying. That was not the case with Clinton. Uh, with Clinton, there was a very glacial due process that went through. And Clinton was adjudicated really over more than a decade. The claim that Bill Clinton is a rapist uh, did not even surface until maybe years after his presidency. And, and that's when all these facts were already out there. People had to sort of chew over them for a long time. So I don't think the cases are uh, uh, identical. They're quite different. Uh, and if somebody came out tomorrow and said literally, let's just say that Al Gore had been nominated for the Nobel Prize. Or Al Gore had been nominated for, let's just say he was nominated for the Secretary General of the UN. And five women surfaced 10 days before the decision and said, Al Gore, you know, uh, groped me. I would say 10 days is not enough to make a fair verdict on a man who's been in public life his whole life. I don't like Al Gore. He makes the worst movies you can ever make. <laughs> Literally a boring man speaking for 90 minutes with pictures of penguins coughing in the background. <laughs> I mean, as a filmmaker, I just have to say that. But that doesn't mean I want to see the man destroyed without due process. So that's my take on Roy Moore. Let's keep going. Um, first, I just want to apologize for the edge lords in the back. Like I said, they can be that question. Is <laughs> my question being, um, what are your thoughts on the FBI's raid of Michael Cohen, Trump's personal attorney, and how do you see that play? idea of the state using investigative powers against political opponents? Look, you know, you raised a very good question a moment ago about, you know, one way to think about this, and, and we, should both, we should all learn this exercise. One way to ask yourself if you're being fair is always flip the ideological tables. I, I tried to do that a moment ago with Al Gore and Roy Moore. So ask yourself this, what if we did this to Obama? What would the media, how would the media react? How would the American people react? And I don't just mean this, any of it. 
Let's just say that 75 Republicans decide we're going to be skipping Obama's inauguration. Thank you, Obama. You won the election. We're not going to be we're not going to be coming to your inauguration. Apoplexy, right? So once you, if you don't admit this, then we're on the, not on the same planet. But if you do admit it, then at least you should grudgingly say maybe I'm being maybe I'm applying a double standard. Now again, as I said today. You could be saying a double standard is completely justified because Trump is a fascist. That's kind of what some people do believe, that it's okay to, to, to throw mud on the wall. But what I'm saying is, no, I mean, this, this, this is like fascist tactics. A guy is cooperating with the FBI, right? And, and notice also what goes on with Mueller. When he doesn't want to raid somebody, he contacts another law enforcement authority, and he tips them off, and then they do the raid. This is, I mean, this is literally like farming out your goons. And, and the, so, so, you know, I always thought of the FBI as this neutral agency. Frankly, I, I had about 10 FBI agents on my own case. One guy was reading my tax returns, one guy was looking at my bank records, a third guy was reading all my books. Um, <laughs> the luckiest of them all, obviously. Uh, but what I'm getting at is I saw them as a professional agency. I saw them as being recruited by Holder and Barrara into this sort of couple hit operation, but it wasn't their operation. It's very worrisome what's going on. I, I just hope that we can find a way to get to the bottom of it. Okay, that's Thank the you. Hi, I started with both the PhD candidate for the science. Now I'd like to ask you uh, what the possible theory could be behind the fact that uh, uh, you know, minorities in the inner cities are still both, you know, poor whites in Africa, right? Uh, so why? You're asking why? Why did we switch to, to a republic? And related to we're talking about nationalism, but I wanted to ask you just nationalism is a teacher, is a, you know, there's a big distinction in political science about this. Nationalism is, you know, I first, and then you, you know, becomes a base of your, you know, freedom, etc. Whereas patriotism is, well, I love my country, etc. Yes. Um, I'll just say one word about patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism has traditionally been associated with the ancestral symbols of a country. Military medals, um, processions, um, uh, demonstrations, uh, a, a respect for um, the Boy Scouts, the uh, Little Leagues, the sort of traditional symbols of American patriotism. It should be said that the fascists were not patriots like that. Mussolini very interestingly said that the Italian flag is a rag to be deposited on a dunghill. Mussolini. Why? Because Mussolini meant, ah, that's bourgeois patriotism. That is the idiot attachment to the old in the belief that it must be good. Mussolini's point was, I'm not attached to that. I'm attached to the fascist society, the socialist Italy that I'm in the process of making. I love that Italy. Now notice that, that with Trump, Trump is a traditional patriot. Trump's, the, the, the symbolism that attracts Trump is exactly the same symbolism that attracted Eisenhower and all the demonstrations of the, of the veterans marching and military men, Trump's into all that. He's a patriot in that sense. Now, the other question was very complicated and important, and I'm gonna answer it this way. It is this, why would people become accessories to their own oppression, why? People are smart, they're not stupid. Now, the simple answer to it is this. The Democratic Party in the 19th century had two strategies, one in the North and one in the South. We are seeing the Northern strategy, and that's why we don't see its kinship to the Southern strategy. The Southern strategy was the plantation, right? So think of the plantation like this. One man A, a Democratic planter, who rips off a slave and steals his labor. It's a straight out theft. You can never expect a slave to vote for you. He hates your guts. You're stealing his labor. But in the North, the Democrats came up with a variation of this. The architect of this, I'm writing about this now, was Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren was the great New York senator, architect of Andrew Jackson's presidency, successor to Andrew Jackson. And here was Van Buren's insight, very important for today. Van Buren's in the North, and obviously there's no support for slavery in the North. And in fact, you don't have slaves, but you do have immigrants. The Irish, the Italians, later the Jews, 
These people are poor, they're desperate, they don't speak the language. And so Van Buren put on his thinking cap. Van Buren had been traveling south, the slave plantation. And he thought to himself, how do I take that system and bring it here? In other words, Van Buren saw the Democratic Party as a national party. And Van Buren thought, I need a, a variation of that scheme. It cannot be A ripping off B. It has to be A collaborating with B to rip off C. So think of it this way. You're the immigrant, poor Irishman. You don't even speak good English. You have no credit, you have no friends, you just arrived on the boat. I'm the Democratic politician of Tammany Hall, let's just say, right? I come to you and I say, hey, listen, I got something I want from you, and it's going to cost you nothing. It's your vote. And since you're kind of an influential guy in the Irish community, I want you to rustle up all your friends and get them as a block to vote for me. I don't want to convince you individually. I want all of you to vote for me. In exchange for that, I'm going to give you a job, and I'm going to give these guys some, some handouts, and I'm going to give this guy a flask of whiskey. Now that you say, well, where are you going to get that from? And I go, we're actually stealing from that guy. He's the taxpayer, right? When you vote me into office, I'll raid the treasury, right? I'll loot the treasury, and out of that, I'll hand out goodies to you, and your only obligation is to keep this process going. When I come up for re-election, you vote me in again, I'll raid the treasury some more, and I'll... So, in other words, step back for a moment, because this is a total perversion of American democracy. This is not what the founders had in mind at all. The founders never thought that democracy is about 51% of people getting in so that they could mercilessly loot the other 49 for four years until the process is reversed. This is a... So that's the model we're seeing today. It's not the old model, it's, I call it the modified plantation scheme. And the modified plantation scheme requires the cooperation of the minorities, but let's be careful because these minorities don't get a whole lot out of it. They, they get crumbs. And what they don't realize a lot of times is that there are no plans for them to leave the plantation. And in fact, very few do. So that's my answer here. Okay, next question. Um, good evening. Is, is it working? Okay, so good evening, um, Mr. D'Souza. I want to thank you for coming out here and speaking to us, the future of Republicans and all that good stuff. And I actually have a different question for you. So my sister is going to be a graduate student next year in New York City. She's deciding between NYU and Columbia. And I'm kind of worried because there is a prevalence of Antifa in New York City. So I'm kind of interested in, in like, Whereabouts of them, where can she encounter them, because she's also Republican, and I'm just kind of worried for her. If you have a definite answer, of course. Yeah, my, my answer is that she should go to an old Halloween store <laughs> and find a, an old witch's costume, black outfit, Take some crayons and write Antifa. Trump sucks, right? And then basically walk around campus as an Antifa person. Except, and this is the, the gorilla element of the strategy, she has to keep spouting slogans that make no sense. I mean, this won't be that hard. It's basically Antifa, right? But what I'm saying is this is a way for her to subvert Antifa while and the great thing about Antifa, too, is that if you parody Antifa, they can't tell. <laughs> right? So, make parody slogans, right? Um, and uh, say things like, like, you know, disarm the campus police, disarm the military, you know? The kind of things that you would certainly say if a whole bunch of outlaws surrounded your house, right? Disarm the cops, come take my stuff. Right? So do Antifa parody and it will blend in with Antifa and your sister will be, not only will she be just fine, she probably will be, be valedictorian. <laughs> So you mentioned that the roots of like the democratic left like back then is like always has been like the root of like 
somewhat like gave rise to like the rule of like fascism and such. But would you say that the tactics that the left is using today is similar to like the communists of like the 1950s and sort of, of like they're trying to play like the role of like them being the victim versus like the people here as we are the oppressors and such? Yeah, but remember that the fascists were the same. Uh, if you read Italian fascism, it's wor very worthwhile, very interesting because of its relevance today. It's not just academic. The Italian fascists always called Italy the proletarian country. And their point was that, look at France, they eat 20 types of cheese. Look at England, they've got colonies all over the world. We Italians are poor laborers, we're farmers. So the fascists reinterpreted the Marxist class struggle into nationalistic terms. They saw the rich countries as the plutocratic nations and countries like Italy as the poor proletarian nations. So what I'm saying is communist fascists, these are cousins. They use the same language. So yes, you know, sometime when you have a chance, play the Soviet national anthem. Soviet, not the Russian, the Soviet national anthem. And then play the Nazi horse vessel song, the Nazi anthem. Notice how similar they are. Look at Nazi art, look at socialist art, very similar. So this is a kinship at a much deeper level than just they're both ideologues of the state. They sound the same, they attract the same kinds of people. Neither side attracted the real working class. In fact, Lenin had to admit that. Lenin admitted, this, we're not the working class, we're professional revolutionaries. We're basically out of work artists and writers and soldiers and revolutionaries. That's who we are, leading this Marxist revolt. The fascists were the same. So, I think that's the answer for you. Thank you. Okay? Yeah. Uh, Mr. D'Souza, um, just want to say I first encountered you in a debate with the late Chris Hitchens, which I actually thought you did quite well against. Um, I have a question about FDR uh, and sort of Keynesian economics because it seems Trump is not necessarily conservative about this issue, rolling out a massive infrastructure package plan. Uh, one of the things that was sort of told to me in my high school that I read was that we got out of the war, we got out of the Great Depression because of the expenditures in World War II. What is a war if not a massive government expenditure? So what is sort of your ideas on that and you know, generally Keynesian economics? Well, you cannot get out of a depression with a war. Uh, because ultimately, the wealth of a society is the sum total of all the productive stuff that is made in the society. I think if we would agree that bombs, weapons, and tanks are not productive in any meaningful sense other than just defeating the enemy, does it make any sense to say that we'll spend half the GNP in making 50,000 tanks and 400,000 bombs and claim that we're out of the depression? No, at, it, 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 at the best what you say is that the government has borrowed this money from the future productivity of the society, spent it now to build all this useless stuff which will have no value when the war is over. And so that any uh, resuscitation of the economy is necessarily temporarily and artificial and fake. The United States did not come out of the Depression because of the war. The United States came out of the Depression because Europe was leveled after the war and America was the country that rebuilt half of the world in the aftermath of the war. And it was that manufacturing and productive boom of the late 40s and 50s that lifted the United States economy into a completely different place. So you, you, you grow as a country by making stuff, not by any other way. And, and don't be confused by, at the end of the day, every other measure, credit, money, trade deficits, balances, it all comes down to, at the end of the day, how much stuff do you have in your yard? That's the productive wealth of America. So by the way, the productive wealth of America, all of it, is about $80 trillion. Our national debt is $20 trillion. Too high a number in my opinion. But again, for people who say things like the United States is going back, we're not going bankrupt, but we've spent 80, we've spent 20 out of our 80. And by the 80, I mean, that's the value of your house and my house and your car and mine and all our bank accounts and all our college funds and everything put together. That's all we have. So, worth keeping in mind. So Keynesian economics, highly suspect. Not in its, not in its, in its micro analysis, but in this fictitious idea that you can spend your way out of a problem. You can no more do that as a country than you can do that as a person. Okay. Hi, 
Mr. D'Souza. Um, I applaud you for your bravery and standing up and telling the truth that little people like us have been trying to do. And you are so brave because if you were a liberal standing up there, you would have no problem. But as a conservative, it is so overwhelming. Um, my question to you is, um, I've been trying to fight for what is right for years now, and our Republicans are ones that fold like wet noodles, that won't stand up for our Constitution and our country um, and our capitalism. What can we do to make them stand up so we have a country? Um, Very good question. Um, So we have these two political parties, and both parties answer to two constituencies. It's the same on, on the Democratic side. The constituency of voters and the constituency of money, of money. Um, when I made my movie, um, Obama's America, um, 2016, I thought, you know, it's interesting, this movie, most of it's not even in America, it's shot in the third world. I said, I wonder what effect this would have, for example, on Latinos. So I asked Frank Luntz, the pollster, to make a focus group and bring in a whole group of people, women. These were in official independent voters, and you define an independent voter like this. If somebody voted for Obama in 2008 and the Republicans in 2010, they're an independent voter because they swing a fence. So we had those guys in the room play my movie. They watch it. At the end of it, let's just say, I don't forget the number of people, but let's say 30 of them walk out the room. 25 of them said, I will never again vote for Obama. Straight out, just by watching the movie in 90 minutes. So I thought, it's very interesting. I go to the RNC and I say, you are spending thousands of dollars on one vote. I have a movie, which is already out in the theater. It costs millions of dollars to make, but it hasn't cost you a penny. I got investors, I made the movie. I'm, it's like a loaded gun, I'm putting it in your hand. All you have to do is take this movie and drop it in the mailboxes of four million swing voters in the United States, in all the swing states, and Romney will win the election. Okay, they look at it. Really good movie, Dinesh. First of all, they tell me all kinds of stupid stuff, like, D Dinesh, has it occurred to you that we're living in a country where people don't really watch movies? <laughs> like, well, name that country. I, I, you know, that's not this country. They go, why don't you take the message of this movie and make it into a 90 second video? I'm like, I've done that, it's called the trailer. <laughs> I use the trailer to get people to see the movie. So after this kind of stuff, which we'll just forgive and leave, and leave aside, they say, here's our idea. If you will basically give us the DVDs for like 10 cents each, right? And I go, first of all, I can't do that because I have investors. I'm trying to return their money. I'm not trying to make a profit in the movie, but I'm trying to get my money back because that's, that's the only way I can make another movie. So I can't do that. And second of all, it's a campaign finance problem. I can't give, a, give you a video for 10 cents that I'm selling on Redbox. No, I can't do that. But it's gonna cost you pennies on the dollar. So there you go, tell you what. If you can give us a deal on the DVDs, when Republicans send us 100 bucks, we'll send them a free DVD as an incentive to give us money. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not a consultant trying to give you fundraising tools to get more money. You're raising the money to win the election. I'm showing you how to do that. That's where I come in, right? No interest. And then I realized, the re I thought to myself, why is that? And it's because to these guys, politics is a business. And the Republican Party is, is in the business, right? Of raising money. And all its slogans and all the stuff are its product. And that's how they see it. So it's very bad, I'm giving you bad news. You have, you, we have to clean out these stables. You know, the, the swamp is, is on our side. And the dance as well. 
them as well. I mean, the, de the ordinary Democrats, I mean, I felt sorry in a way for some of the Bernie guys. A lot of them are completely clueless. I mean, Bernie's clueless, so what, you know, no surprise there. Um, the, um, Bernie was like Rip Van Winkle, right? He woke up two years later, cell phones, you know, he couldn't believe it. Um, markets, incentives, Silicon Valley, you know, couldn't believe it. So, but his voters were genuine. They were just no match for the sly, you know, Hillary camp. Um, the sly Hillary camp was just far too smart for these buffoons. Um, they, they knew, who cares about the Democratic rank and file guy, let's go capture the Democratic National Committee. That's how we can get to feed questions to the media. We don't have to pay them, they're on our camp already. They're looking for the questions. That's how we get to read the New York Times articles in advance and edit them before they even appear. I mean, this is going on in America. So, it's, it's, a sad, it's sad news for us, it's sad news for them too. Um, this is the corruption of our system. And look, I'm just really happy. People say, no, just go run for this, go run for that. I'm really happy being independent. I make my own films, I write my own books. This, you say I'm brave, I'm not that brave. The, the reason I'm brave is because, because they can't do anything to me. Like take Hollywood. Right? They give me the Razzie, you're the worst actor ever. I go, I can't be the worst actor ever, I'm playing myself. <laughs> I'm the world's expert at being me. But, okay, I'll take your Razzie, who cares? Um, but see, if I worked in Hollywood for, you know, Sony, then I'd have to watch my back. It's like if I was in academia, I'd have to watch my back, I'm up for tenure. I can't say this, I can't, I can't write this book on LBJ, oh my gosh. LBJ is the moral conscience of the Democratic Party. The very guy who came out six weeks ago was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. The moral conscience of the Democratic Party. Appropriate in a way. All right, next question. Hi, Dinesh. Uh, so thank you for coming here, first of all. It's, it's really great to hear you speak. Uh, so, so I was talking to my friend yesterday, and she, she asked me if I was coming to see you. And I, and I said, yeah. And, and she goes, oh, God, Dinesh, she's a conservative, right? And I go, yeah. She's like, oh, fuck conservatives. So I'm like, you know, I just sat there and I go, okay. But I realized that it's, it's not such a crazy thing to say in this day and age. You know, you could say that you hate all conservatives and, you know, even conservatives will just say, you know, I don't agree, but I don't, I don't want to start anything. If you said the other way, that would be a major problem. Uh, so I think one of the reasons that is is because, you know, we go through middle school and we go through high school and we get this very simplified and wrong version of history that, you know, North is anti-slavery, South is pro-slavery, and then we come out of that and we already believe these ideas and we're reluctant to accept the ideas that, that you speak about. So, so what do you see as, as a solution perhaps to, to change the way people think earlier on? Because I think once people think these things in college, it, it's already for a lot of them too, too late to change. Yeah, it is a, if I had to identify the greatest weakness on the conservative side, it's not in politics. Um, it, is in, it is in the sphere of what you could call disseminating information to young people and to citizens. Um, it's not just on the campus. See, there are campuses that are imbalanced. When I was at Dartmouth, it was a liberal campus. But it was not a liberal campus where you couldn't find a conservative professor in a department. It wasn't that way. It was the idea that the conservative professor was kind of outnumbered, and in the political science department out of 10, there were only three. But the, I, I never envisioned at that time that we would come to an America where in a, in a department of 20, there would be none. That actually is a very bad situation for liberalism, according to John Stuart Mill, because he, go, he argues that liberalism now has nothing to check it, to hold it accountable, to put intellectual pressure on it. It's bad news even for liberals, but they don't see it that way because to them it's like, hey, it's great, you know, we kicked all the conservatives out of the department, we're going to make sure never to hire one again. You know, victory. You know, but victory means that tomorrow somebody will write a really sloppy book and they will leave out all kinds of facts, right? But they will have staked out the far left stance and every other professor will be in silent terror that they say, this book sucks. This person would then say, you're a racist, you're a member of the patriarchy, you're, you're an apologist for colonialism, and the whole department would be intimidated into submission. This is, a, this is 
I think you'll realize this is not an inaccurate description of what happens, not everywhere in academia, but in a lot of places. Very bad news. Very bad for anybody who loves real debate, real intelligence, real inquiry. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned my debates with Hitchens, right? So I've always tried to engage, even on issues of philosophy and God, against the strongest person on the other side. I'm the opposite of Rachel Maddow. Rachel Maddow will only have a conservative, in fact, I kind of worry about this because sometimes I know the person on the, on the show, but her philosophy is, find the stupidest conservative. I can. Because then I can, get, I can make mincemeat of them and then people go, oh wow, she's so smart, Rachel Maddow, wow. C student, but she's blossomed on TV. Why? Because she's debating the stupidest person she could find in America. But she'll never have an actual serious opponent. Like, she, like, look at this, I make a movie, I write a book on fascism, number one New York Times bestseller. When I put on Hillary's America, that movie was not mentioned on CBS, ABC, NBC, CNN, or MSNBC, even though it's in over a thousand theaters and it's about the election. It was not even mentioned. Why? Because I'm not an idiot. If they put me on, it's now a fight. Now we'll see how much you know about fascism, Rachel Maddow. But she doesn't want that. So she doesn't go for it. So this is bad. And this is, this, is, this is part of our media now. So this is what I'm fighting every day. So if you ask yourself what to do, you have to think of creative ways to combat this. And there are such ways. OK? Let's keep going. I just want to be able to cover some more ground. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, let's speed it up. Uh, Dinesh, great honor to have you here. Thank you for coming to Stony Brook. Just, you know, this is the coolest damn thing since the world was played by the TV. Uh, and yes, you guys have to write out their questions real quick. The right sees the world as it is, the left imagines it as to be. Even if they need to destroy it to create the utopian hallucination. The left's disordered thinking ultimately is a theological problem, and America is simply the largest part of the collapsing Western civilization. We have one party rule in California, New York will be next. Dinesh, should we not start to separate this voluntary union of states before the shooting begins? Well, <clears throat> let's think about this for a minute. The situation facing the United States in 1860, and you know, it's, it, to me it's just so strange to hear all these people debate the Civil War today, you know. And I, I, I get that if you're like a Civil War reenactor, you know, you've got your own wacky theory about the war of northern aggression, the war of this, the war of that. Leave all that aside. Look at it from Lincoln's point of view. It's very, it's very illuminating because Lincoln comes in, he's elected in November of 1860. Now he doesn't take office until late March, different than now. You don't take office in January. This was what people, historians call the long secession winter. Before Lincoln is even inaugurated, six states have seceded already. And so Lincoln, for Lincoln, the Civil War was not, it was actually a very simple issue. The Democratic Party, particularly the Southern Democrats, will not accept the result of a free election. I won, and they've decided that since I won, the game is over, and they're going to pick up their toys and go home. Now Lincoln immediately jumps in, and this is in his annual message to Congress. He goes, now look, I won very narrowly. I won an electoral majority, not a popular majority. Sound familiar? And he goes, and on top of that, in a system of limited government, my power is very limited. It's limited by what the Constitution authorizes. So, if I have actually violated the rights of the minority, if I have taken away somebody's right to free speech, or their right to vote, or their right to freely assemble, or their right to own a gun, <coughs> If I had done any of these things, they would have every right to revolt and to secede. But Lincoln says, I have not done that. And therefore, the secession is an attack on free government itself. How can you have a democratic system if the losers won't accept the outcome? That was what caused the Civil War. The refusal of the Democratic Party in the South, but with secret allies in the North. To, to, to refuse to accept Lincoln's election. In that sense, the situation is kind of eerily similar right now. 
obviously the, the left isn't seceding. Um, there's been some talk of seceding in California. I don't think we're in, the, in a shooting war. But I also think that this is why these so-called never-Trumpers are slightly out to lunch. Now, by slightly out to lunch, I don't mean I have my own reservations about Trump. But here's what I do mean. You have a whole group of people, some of them friends of mine, they're like, we're pining for Reagan. Trump isn't Reagan. He doesn't cock his head. He doesn't make jokes, self-deprecating jokes. And I'm like, that was then. That was the 1980s. Reagan, it was an era of gentleman's politics. Reagan could cock his head and make a joke in the full expectation that Sam Donaldson, the butt of the joke, would have himself laugh. Reagan could, could, could cock his head and make a joke in the belief that a Reagan, that a, that a Democrat in Tip O'Neill's bar in Boston would look at Reagan and go, I like that guy. That's funny. Reagan knew that. That's not the America we live in now. The America we live in now would be incomprehensible to Reagan, but fully comprehensible to Lincoln. Because for Lincoln, you try to compromise, and Lincoln did compromise. And Lincoln compromised in, you would almost say, ridiculous ways. But at the end of the day, Lincoln said, I'm not compromising the electoral majority that I won and the American people gave me in this just completed election. And he goes, not only, do I not, not only do I not want to do that, I cannot do it. Because once the American people have ratified it, it's not my majority anymore, it's theirs. I am now the mere trustee of it. So for me to compromise is basically to spit on democracy itself. I've run a campaign, I said I'm going to do X, they're now trying to stop me from doing X, even though I won the election based on X. And this is where Trump is. Trump is like, you can think I'm the stupidest guy in the world, I said I would have tariffs. Now you can call me a free trader, a tariff guy, a this or a that. I, I don't think it's obvious that Trump is against free trade. He might be using leverage to achieve free trade, to make the other guy take his tariffs down. But it doesn't matter. Trump's point is, I campaigned on it. I told you I was going to do it. I won, and now I'm doing it. Look, you know, I mean, I've written in favor of free trade all my life, but I say to myself, my argument for free trade is free trade is good for the wretched of the earth. If you're some poor guy in Indonesia or in Thailand or in India, free trade is really good for you. But Trump was not elected to represent that guy. Trump was elected to represent the interests of the American people. Hi, thank you for coming today. Um, the left claims that they are supporters of minorities. Um, but they always forget one minority, uh, people of color who are conservatives. Once you're a person of color who's a conservative, you're a race trader. I'm a Puerto Rican from Manhattan, Queens, and now I currently live in Albany, New York. Um, as a college student, what advice do you have to give for conservatives, and particularly conservatives who are people of color in a blue state on a college campus? Well, I would say that your destiny is, and it might seem mine the same way, it's both perilous and very privileged. It's perilous in the sense that you are the people that they hate the most. Hate the most. Um, the, notice that if you look at our history books, there's one African American who is probably the greatest African American in all of American history. But most people don't even know his name. His name doesn't even appear in most textbooks, so if it appears, it's very cursory. It's Frederick Douglass. Why? Not just because Frederick Douglass was a Republican, no. After the Civil War, the Civil War is over. The white Republicans have all these schemes for reparations. 40 acres and a mule, let's uh, divide the property of the Confederates and give. And Frederick Douglass stands up and he gives a speech. It's called, What Shall Be Done for the Black Man? And Frederick Douglass gives the following answer. Absolutely nothing. He says, you have done enough for us and to, to us Leave us the hell alone. If we can't succeed, we'll fall flat on our faces. Now, think of this. This is like progressive heresy. Now, it'd be one thing if Newt Gingrich said it. They wouldn't care. But for Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, the greatest man, one of the greatest men of American history, it's untouchable. So they hate him for it. And they, their punishment on him is that every second or third-rate guy is elevated to the sky 
but no mention of Frederick Douglass. You know, we have a dream that the content of our character, Frederick Douglass talked about that a hundred years earlier, and more eloquently. But, no one knows about it. Nobody reads his speeches. Why? He's the ultimate heretic. So that's what you are. That's what I am. Now, our power comes from the fact that, that, that we're hated, but we're hated for a good reason. And that is, we, partly because of the accident of our own skin color, have an unbelievable ability to kick their butts. Um, if everything I said today, if you pick some guy, some chubby white guy from Texas, and I was the ventriloquist, and I just spoke from him, and he said exactly what I said tonight, it wouldn't have the same impact. Why? Because he's a white guy. In short, you and I have some ethnic immunity, which is a great liberation, and we should use it, is what I'm telling you, effectively. Now to do that, you've got to be thick-skinned, you've got to be creative, you've got to be brave, uh, and you've got to realize that you've been given this sort of privilege, I'm using that term. It's not white privilege, it's non-white privilege, and use it. Use it well, okay? Let's go. It's commonly posited that he was the main attack on uh, the driving force in the drug war, which has been one of the most catastrophic policies in modern American history. And I'd like to ask you, do you think that's because of his lack of cosmopolitan sympathies? Or do you think that the drug war is in part caused by his racism? Can you refute that? Yes, the, okay. So, I, you know, I came to America in 1978. There was no drug war. The, the hippies loved drugs, which had been widespread in the 70s. Um, Nancy Reagan chose as her issue, just say no. There was no drug war, it was just say no. Uh, refuse drugs, because we can now see from quite a bit of evidence that these drugs are addictive, they're bad for you, etc. And remember that in the 70s, the drug war was not a black problem. Most of the druggies were white guys with long hair. Uh, and, and when Nixon attacked the drug war, you can even see this in Nixon's commercials. You might remember a song that Merle Haggard rec recorded, I think in 1974, The Oki from Muskogee, right? We don't smoke marijuana in Muskogee. We don't take our trips on LSD. Um, we don't burn our draft cards down on Main Street. We like living right and living free. Now, ask yourself, is that a racist? No. He's not talking about blacks. Now, in the 90s, under the Clintons, you started getting three strikes and you're out. These people are super predators. Lock them up and throw away the key. Um, this is not a phenomenon of the 70s. Nixon has nothing to do with this. All that Nixon has to do with it is when Nixon talked about law and order, Nixon basically said, there's an ordinary dude in Long Island, and not even the South, and in Pittsburgh, and in Atlanta, and in Phoenix, and in California, and this guy goes to work every day, pays his taxes, works hard to look after his family. This is the forgotten American. This guy who plays by the rules, nobody listens to him because he doesn't complain. Everybody else is on TV. Uh, I need to be actualized, I need to fulfill myself, I'm being oppressed. Um, and Nixon's point is, somebody needs to stand up, not for the rich guy, but for the ordinary, hard-working guy who's just trying to get by. That was Nixon's forgotten American. Again, not a racist symbol. And uh, it was Nixon, Nixon going after what would later be called the Reagan Democrats. The people that Trump got in 2016. So, now, the, the, what makes this complicated is in private, Nixon was extremely insecure and hated everybody. So if you go to the Nixon Library in, in Whittier and you listen to the Nixon tapes in private, oh my gosh, he doesn't like Italians, he doesn't like the Irish, he doesn't like Jews, he calls the ancient Greeks fags. I mean, this guy is out of control, but he's a Machiavellian, he's very clever, and he he's very thoughtful about what he says in public, and so none of this appears in the public domain. Okay, next question. Thank you very much. 
Thank you for being here, uh, Mr. D'Souza. My question for you is, um, in 2008, George Bush was pretty much the last Republican in Washington. In 2016, Mr. Obama was pretty much the last Democrat in Washington. Is Trump destined for the same fate? I mean, by the early returns from 2018, he kind of seems like he is. If he's not, how can we change that? Can you just say one line about what you mean by the last? You, you mean that you mean that he's still standing, but his party has been wiped out at the base? Pretty much, in that they're wiped out of Congress. Yeah. So the way to think about this is that American politics moves in tectonic movements that are usually pretty long-lasting. So think about this. The Democratic Party was the majority party from 1828, when it was founded by Andrew Jackson, to 1860. 40 years of dominance. In 1865, the Republican Party became the majority party, a position it held till 1932. 40 years. From 1932 to 1980, the Democrats were once again the majority party. And by majority party, I mean they controlled most of it, and they set the agenda. You might have a Republican in there, but he's going to be carried by the Democratic tide, as Eisenhower was, or Nixon. Um, now, since 1980 to now, American politics has been a kind of draw. And that is strange. We haven't had that in almost 150 years, since the party system itself. And everything came up for grabs in 2016. That's why the left was so bummed, because they thought they had it. Uh, and think of all the stuff that's coming out now, all of that would have been repressed had Hillary been elected. All of it would have been shut down. Um, all these people thrashing around, you know, and they're all now trying to find a rhetoric that works for them. You know, think of poor Comey, right? Comey's like, this is his rhetoric, and I, I'm waiting for his book, because I, I, I'm going to give you a summary of his book now in about five seconds. His summary of his book is this. I, young James, was raised to do the right thing no matter what the cost. I, young James, went to school and I got bad grades, but that's because I told the truth. And then I, young James, went to the FBI. In other words, he never thinks to himself, most people who make meteoric rises through organizations are massive ass kissers. They do it not by doing the right thing. They do, they do it by doing what they're told and kowtowing to people in power. And that is the most greasy pole that is most likely, the most likely explanation for your ascent. Now, you'd have a modicum of decency if you admitted that. Uh, but, no, you know, you've got to go with the fable. Um, and so, this is what we're getting now, is all this cover-up, all this flim-flam, all this madness, um, all this rubble. And we, the citizen, have to see through it. And as I say, it's very hard to do, even on this fake scholarship. Think of it this way. You can pick up the National Review, you can pick up the Weekly Standard, you can pick up 20 other magazines. All the stuff I've been talking about appears in none of them. Why? Because they know it's not true? No. It's because they don't want to touch it. They're scared. They're scared of it. They're scared of the material. They don't know it. You know? Their whole thing has been, oh, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. And then you say, well, what about Andrew Jackson? You know? So conservative rhetoric is itself polluted by all this. Um, look at racism. Okay, I'll be honest with you. For 20 years when I started thinking about racism, I fell into the conservative trap of always trying to show that things are not so bad. Why? Because I loved America. So I was always trying to show, America's not so bad. Yes, there was slavery, but we were the first to abolish slavery. But I never thought of the question, asking this question. Because the left has been so clever when they say, you know, America did segregation, America did slavery, America did the Klan, America did racial terrorism. And I'm thinking, I never thought to, to ask America, well, America didn't do any of this. Some Americans did this, and other Americans stopped them. So let's ask, who is who? That question has never been asked. Before. the mainstream media anymore. People are now looking for alternative news sources to seek the truth. Just like mainstream media, all news sources can be biased as well. 
my question to you is, do you believe any news sources, mainstream or alternative, are bias-free? No. But, but let's, speak, let's look to see what we're trying to achieve. I would agree that in a certain abstract sense, to be absolutely free of bias is impossible. Why? Because we're human beings, we don't have the God's eye view of the universe. Our view is necessarily partial, angular, perspectival. And so we're going to have a take on the world. And that take is, is determined by our situation, right? Years ago I had a debate with Jesse Jackson, and it was really funny because I realized that we were talking about the same thing, but we saw it totally differently. And instead of arguing with him, I thought to myself, why do he and I see the same fact so different? It's like we're both sitting in a cafe, we see an accident, and he thinks it's a homicide, and I think it's an accident, but how could, we, we could, how could two reasonable people who saw the same thing disagree like that? And then it occurred to me that the reason we see it a little like that is because I'm an immigrant, and he is the leader of an indigenous American minority group that's been here for a very long time. So, the, the immigrant is always comparing America to something else. I come from India, I come from Africa, I come from South America, and so people say, America sucks! And I go, America sucks compared to Bombay, compared to Indonesia, compared to Thailand? What are you talking about? But if you live in America and you've never been anywhere else and you don't know anything else, you're going to compare America to the Garden of Eden. To a, you'll compare America to perfection. And so you're going to be super mad and go, I can't believe it that, you know, this is going on in America. Never mind that it's going on everywhere else and it's much worse. But the fact that it's going on here at all, you're using the utopian standard. So, so in other words, the, the, the angle of reference is not the same. So here's what I'm saying. When I, when I listen to a reporter, I'm not expecting them to be free of bias. But what I'm expecting them to do is, number one, to call it like they see it. Number two, to actually tell us what's going on and not to omit facts that are inconvenient from their point of view. And number three, to show a little bit of humility because most reporters, quite honestly, don't know anything. They don't know any economics. They've never studied it. They don't know any history. They've never encountered it. They went to Columbia Journalism School where they learned about the inverted pyramid and how to write a paragraph, right? But their content is zero. And so the most you expect from those people is a little epistemological modesty, such as, I have no idea what's going on in North Korea right now. I don't even have a clue. It's like asking me what's happening right now in Mars. You shouldn't ask because I don't know. But I'm telling you what other people are telling me. I'm repeating that for your benefit, and hopefully, through my filter, you can try to figure things out for yourself, because you can't possibly expect to get anything out of me. And I don't want them to say that, but a little humility would help. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. D'Souza, for coming out today. Uh, so my family is very liberal. Both my parents are Indian immigrants. My sister is very liberal. Myself used to be very liberal until I sort of exposed myself to different views. So my question to you is, how would you advise me to really expel the sort of myth that conservatism is this evil force and liberal, liberalism is definitely beneficial? You're you're fighting a big narrative, right? And you're fighting against a narrative that's blared out at you every day, and you're fighting a description of yourself by other people that is unrecognizable to you. This is our plight, right? So literally, I think the guy, for example, who jumped up and goes, you're for colonialism, you know? It's, 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 first of all, he has no idea how often I hear this stuff, right? He, he probably thinks he's, he's, he's stunning me with an original, you know, absolute Tyson punch, right? But in fact, this is what I heard like three days ago. And I'm going to Florida to speak tomorrow and I'll hear it again, right? And, and, and the more, more pompous the progressive is, the more preposterous this formulation. Like this one guy comes up to me, he goes, he goes Mr. D'Souza, he goes, decolonize your mind. You know? and, and, and so think about what he's saying, right? What he's basically saying is that I have a mind, but I really don't because someone else has occupied it, right? This dude who I've never met before somehow knows this. 
right? And he has access to this captivity. He can see inside my head that somebody else is owning my mind, right? And he's urging me to break free of the shack. I mean, this is like stand-up comedy stuff, right? <laughs> If we had real comedy in this country, this is like what people like would be talking about, like Bill Maher. Instead of talking about things like, Trump is stupid. Ha ha ha, you know, thunderous applause. Comedy. Comedy. Um, so you're up against all this. My solution? Yes, you should puncture it, you know? But what's even better is do, do supply side economics. Ask yourself, what is it that I do well? Like, I would love to see a young, conservative, politically incorrect to the max comedian. 23 years old, who starts a web channel, right? And it should be called F Political Correctness, right? In which no taboo is left standing in any direction. It's absolutely equal opportunity massacre. Frankly, there was a person who would have done this, but he's not alive anymore, George Carlin. Yeah, he would be the guy. He was on the left, but I believe if he was alive today, he knew where comedy goes. Comedy goes where there's a taboo. You know? Me too! Yeah? I wish we had Carmen. He would know what to do with me too. Uh, and, uh, all right, let's take a, uh, okay, we're done here. Let's move quickly through the next few questions just so we can wrap it up. And, um... Aiden Eshman, this is Nick. I just wanted to say on behalf of the, as a secretary of the Hofstra College Republicans, we'd love to have you there at our university too. Among all uh, Democrat presidents, which one do you think comes the closest to being a Republican president? Um, in the 20th century, I would say JFK. Um, because JFK was a genuine, anti-communist and a genuine tax cutter. JFK actually believed in free markets. FDR did not. Um, FDR has uh, this great mystique around him, right? And see, this is the benefit of coming from another country. Because here's FDR. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Talk about dumb. <laughs> Imagine this. I have cancer. I'm about to die. I go to the doctor. I go, I don't have any money. Uh, this is the depression, right? My house is gone. My family is leaving me. I'm thinking of throwing myself on the sixth floor of my apartment building. I'm suicidal. I'm desperate. I'm broke. The only thing you have to fear is fear itself. I'd be like, are you out of your mind? The only thing I have to fear is the situation that's killing me. That's what I have to, my fear is a rational response to that. Right? Literally, FDR, this guy has such a high opinion of himself that, that four years later, he's talking to an associate and he goes, in the old days, we feared fear. But then I took on fear. We fought fear and we won. This is the FDR. And I'm like, again, this is like Peter Sellers and being there. Right? The depression, by the way, doesn't end till the late, FDR goes through four terms and he can't end the depression. And literally, this is the guy that progressives today, biographers, Robert Dalek, William Luchtenberg, Arthur Schlesinger, the greatest American president. Literally, FDR, they're serious, they aren't kidding. We want to if it was a joke, but it's not a joke, they mean it. Um, so, JFK, pretty good. He was only in for two years, very short. Who knows what he would have done. Um, but, and then you have to go back further in history. I mean, I admire Polk. A Polk basically um, almost doubled the size of the United States. Uh, he did some of it through the Mexican War, he did some of it through treaties, but the United States became a world power, unbelievably, thanks to James Polk in one term, Democrat. Um, slave owner, uh, but nevertheless, patriot. And then I have mixed things to say about other people. Andrew Jackson, very bad guy, crook, but also a patriot. Um, so I'm not entirely against him. I don't think Trump should keep his photo in the office. I'd take it down myself. <laughs> but Trump doesn't know that. Uh, all right, next question. Thank you. Sorry. Pardon me? Uh, we, we have to end the Q&A because you know, our time is up. Uh, it's been well over you know, time. And yes. the discussion has been amazing, but time is up. 
Okay. Um, well, it's sort of like it's sort of like a box in these situations. My goal is to be still standing at the end. And, um, look, I would I would love to stay and answer more, and I'm always open to discussing these issues on social media or further. If you guys want me to come to Hofstra, talk to me later. We'll see if we can work it out. this evening and I want you to understand that even though I, I try to very forcefully say what I believe and I do believe it, my goal really is just to take you by the lapels and get you to think. Um, to me, my, my, my real liberation at, at coming to America was more intellectual than anything else. If I think of the way my life has changed, it's changed most because uh, America was for me the opening of Dinesh's mind. Um, and um, and I, I want you to take that take on that venture. And what better place to do it than right here? So look, thank you. You know, this is you came here two hours ago, and this is a long event, and not a whole lot of you got up and left. And that means that we've covered a lot of tough issues, but you have hung in there. And I urge you to keep learning and keep thinking. And thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. <laughs>